Hi, you've probably seen documentaries about early 3D computer generated special effects, but have you ever wondered how Pixar printed Toy Story on film for a theater projection? Or how the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park were merged with the real footage? Well, this video will shed some light on this mystery. Today, we'll explore a fascinating piece of hardware. For those who know me personally, you know I have a particular appreciation for CRT devices, and today's device fits the bill. As you may have guessed, I will explain the theory of operation of this rare yet fascinating Solitaire 16 from MGI, a 16K professional film recorder for motion pictures from 1990. Then we'll explore the hardware and proceed to the repair. We'll also do a test print, so stay until the end to see the results. First of all, what is optical printing and what is the use case? You're all familiar with how camera works. A lens is focusing rays from a real scene onto a film. Well, this works a similar way, except instead of a real-life scene, we're having a cathode ray tube slowly exposing the image to the film, one line at a time. Oh, and I forgot, one color at a time. Red, green, blue, and sometimes white to put an overlay with some data on the film. You could print single frames or still photos, but this device were also used in Hollywood-type film productions. A film chamber was attached to the head, and a computer would control the film loader to forward to the next frame after printing. Animation films such as Toy Story were first rendered on computers like this, then 100% printed on film for projection using this technology. It was also used a lot for special effects on movies like Jurassic Park, The Mask, Terminator 2, and even more recently Avatar and Interstellar. But the process was a bit more complex. As it was a mix of real footage and special effects, there were multiple passes to be printed involving a mask called matte. The mask would hide the part where the special effects would be printed, so there would not be any superimposition. I won't go into the details of matte printing in this video, there's a lot of literature out there. So here it is, the MGI Solitaire 16, a 16K optical printer, and multiple models were available, but this one is the top of the line. It was accepting a variety of camera modules depending on the film time you wanted to print on, 35mm, 70mm, 4x6, etc. The back has a fused 120 volt plug as well as two connectors to hook to a computer, a GPIB interface and a pair of faster SCSI connectors, one input and one output for daisy chain or to be terminated. The front panel has a set of colored control buttons as well as a nice VFD display for menus and status. Let's open it, all the magic happens inside. Everything is proprietary and it's virtually impossible to find any documentation on this formerly expensive device. No service manuals, no block diagram, so I'll try to make educated guesses. There are three main boards, what I'll call the compute and interface board. Believe it or not, the core of this machine is a good old Motorola 68K, assisted by this magnificent DMA controller. The eight RAM chips of 256 kilobit each are providing a whopping half megabyte of RAM. Yes, this machine has about the same computing power and architecture as this first Atari ST, or this calculator. Interesting choice on a decade older processor, not sure if it was a budget or ease of development decision. There are a couple of quartz clocks on this board, but the main CPU is cadenced by the 16 MHz one. The OS is loaded from those four EEPROMs, I have extracted their content just in case. If there's enough interest, I will dive into the code, let me know in the comment section. This chip here is a SCSI controller. The second board is fed by two large I.O. connectors from the previous board and seems to host more ROMs, RAMs and logic. I can only guess this is where the LUTs profiles are applied, as this board is sandwiched between the compute board and the driver board. Each film has a different emulsion mix, meaning a different color profile, so you can choose which film type you want to print on through the menu. By probing the signals, it seems that this board is where the raw image data from the I.O. board is processed. Once color space and LUT profile is applied, it will forward it onto the next board, located on the other side of the machine. So this is what I would call the driver and deviation board. On this side, they spared no expense. Really spectacular, spared no expense. Just take a look at these beautiful video DACs. They're pretty expensive too. This is the equivalent of what you could find in a CRT television or monitor but way better. I didn't spend a lot of time on this board, but this is what controls the tube raster's brightness and deviation. A calibration sensor is used during the boot up process to ensure an uncompromised quality. 
As for the high voltage, it's generated from a shielded flyback module under this board. Now, of course, it wouldn't be fun if this worked right away. First, the machine didn't power at all. After checking the fuses, I had to take the huge power supply out. This is an off-the-shelf power supply from the era, also used in medical equipment. After tracking the issue down, I had to replace the main MOSFET driver that was shorted, as well as a few caps on the secondary that were out of specs. After checking the voltages and stability, the machine turned on for the first time after who knows how long. Oh, another source of concern, the Dallas chips. Those have a battery molded in their body and have a limited lifetime. The first one is a real-time clock and I'm not too worried about it failing. The second one though is an NVRAM and I'm afraid it could lose its content and eventually break the machine. This was verified by the first two error messages I got. Processor failed errors that are throwing the subcode no VRAM verification. The second and main issue I had was an infinite number of error messages during the boot self-test sequence. By the way, it takes forever. This is the longest boot time I've ever seen. I am now facing a more serious issue on test 211 throwing a color board failed error with a subcode intensity cable. After depleting all my visual inspection abilities, I've checked all the chip's supply voltage, everything good here as well. I then started probing the whole I.O. bus and found some weak signals. I tried many things including testing and reseeding many ICs, but nothing made a difference. I also spotted a few soldering bubble residues all over the boards, so I scraped and cleaned everything. I will never know if it was a contact issue or a short caused by one of these beads, but after this step, the MGI finally booted. Once the hundreds of tests passed, the machine detected the camera module and initialized the color wheel. It is now ready to print. Now the machine is running, we can dive into the menus. We have some main categories to set the film type, the camera module, the resolution, calibrate and adjust connectivity. Let's try printing a calibration pattern. It doesn't show very well on the camera, but this is the thinnest raster I've ever seen. I'd say as thin as a hair. As you can see, it's pretty slow. I don't have any film on hand, so I thought I could use a frosted glass in place of the film and a long exposure on the DSLR. These are the steps of me printing my current YouTube channel's banner picture. It takes over a minute to print each color, and the fourth step is just the frame number with the Solitaire's diamond logo. When combining all four frames, this is the final result you would get on the film. I'm really impressed and I see why we would use this technology. There's no way any LCD or other digital technology from back then would have rendered something with that definition without a single visible pixel or screen door effect. That's it for today. Next step is to work on the film feeding module, but that's for another video. I hope you enjoyed the tour of this amazing device, and as usual, thanks for watching.